it's Ray. Today we have Annabelle on Myazine. For those who don't know her, she is one of my favorite YouTubers and her editing is such a big inspiration for my own channel. She is a YouTuber, but mostly she is a multidisciplinary artist. You might know her as Piper Blue. She has a store with handmade goods like prints, stationery, clothes, accessories. I really love the concept. And when I got to New York, I DM her because she lives there. And to my surprise, one day while I was in bed, I realized that she had responded to me saying that she would love to meet and be on this series. So I think it's fair to say we both had a really good morning. We started off with a coffee date and then went to Central Park to film the video and finished by taking a little little trip to the mat. And so it was really nice to connect, especially with someone that has a background in art because I myself was an art student and I just miss having those types of conversations. We approached so many topics. So this is basically just a recorded conversation. It's longer than the majority of my videos, but I didn't want to cut out more parts. So yeah, let me know who you want to see next in the series and without further ado welcome to the second episode of inside the life and closet of annabelle so hey uh, hello today i'm here with annabelle and i can't believe because i've been watching your videos for so long and we just had coffee and had a really good chit chat about a lot of different things. I wish we recorded some parts because there was some really nice conversation. I know. It was such a nice little breakfast for me. Mm -hmm. You came all the way down here into the city. So it was very exciting to meet Maya and to hear a little bit about how we have a lot of similarities in common. I think, when it comes yeah. To, like pursuing self employment, mm -hmm. being an artist, and just oh, kind of being so more cool. open to what lies ahead in our future rather than like following. I think most of our conversation today was just like not being scared to be pressured into following the timeline that society yes. has for us. Yeah, I think that's a very like cliche topic, but at the same time, because of cliche, it's cliche, people don't talk about it. We dig a lot deeper into that. This is cute. I feel like we're actually in a park having a conversation because the camera is so being far recorded. away. It's so fun. It's been forever since I've done a collab video with someone. I'm very excited and it's about fashion too, so. Yeah, um, what I was gonna ask you first is like, how does a typical day in your life look like? I know like our days, they don't have a structure, they can really vary, but there's always a similar yeah. thing. I think a typical day will look like getting out of bed on my own time. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorite things is that I could try to adjust when I start work, right? Like yeah. as soon as I get up, I'll probably try to avoid being on the screen too soon. So I'll like, really make it a point to eat breakfast and not even change out of my pajamas until it's time to actually do something like film or go outside mm -hmm. so I could like stay all day in my pajamas um, but a typical day would probably look like catching up on emails that I didn't feel like doing the night before <laughs> and then I would spend a few hours on that and then I'll eat lunch and then like every day my activities look different I want to say like probably two out of the days I'll be editing in a week and then two days I would like to be painting in the studio mm -hmm. and then lastly it would be almost like I take half a day off and I'm doing martial arts class in the afternoon um, and then I will have I don't know like a cafe day like today mm -hmm. or yeah. um, in the afternoon with another friend. How do you feel like you balance routines working from home because I think it's hard to like have decide if you have a wake-up hour or decide how your morning routine will look like and sometimes everything will just blend and you don't know when you're working and when you're not. I think that is still kind of a problem for me but I almost try to embrace the nice part of not having a routine mm -hmm. and to not let caring about routine so much get in the way of my happiness and get in the way of living in the moment where routine is important for me to anchor myself like every morning I will try to eat breakfast and I'll try to drink water and those are like the simple keystone mm -hmm. habits that I have mm -hmm. but other than that um, I make sure that every week I have like let's say three deadlines or a bunch of things on my to-do list but it's very flexible so if I miss yeah. out on one day it can push and push mm -hmm. to maybe the third or fourth day so there's uh -huh. a lot of more freedom I give myself it was so hard um, for the first six months of living here of like not feeling when my boundaries would end or begin mm -hmm. like when does my life begin but I think the key thing I figured out was finding my own life outside of the content I'm making and finding yes. the permission to not vlog something because I'm like this is about me right now this is for me mm -hmm. I feel like now especially with YouTube there's this era that's coming of being more 
um, authentic and not like romanticizing everything like with the high saturation era of like the morning routines like everyone did right, this perfect structure right. and morning routine now people are kind of realizing how everything can just flow and be flexible yeah and i think there's something that attracts us to stability and predictability that yeah. we like to watch them but mm -hmm. then in reality it's almost like a prison to have that same yeah. thing happen every single day and I, like my personality gets bored with that mm -hmm. recently i've been wanting to do yoga every morning mm -hmm. but then some days i realize like wow i really have to get this video done yeah i just can't do it and i'm not gonna make myself feel guilty that's that's the good thing about self-employment is that you have your own schedule but then we force ourselves to make the nine to five schedule when there's no necessity for yeah. that as long as we get the work done it doesn't really matter right and so much of our time is a construct other than the fact that yes like predictably 24 hours a day the sun yeah. will pass from here to there but like the days of the week and the gregorian calendar that we follow it's all societally built yeah. and like we follow that so then we think like on the weekends it's time for the rest on mondays uh -huh. it's time to get back into focus and then like such a good part of being self-employed is like having this this flexibility yeah um almost just realizing every day when I wake up I'm gonna decide what kind of day this is gonna be mm -hmm. and like what kind of day do I feel like it like even for fashion like my style is how I wake how up. I wake up feeling today mm -hmm. and it's so much better than trying to define myself like, how did you wake myself. up feeling today <laughs> I think very monochromatic so mm -hmm. like some days I love to try to wear like all the same family colors mm -hmm. um and then today it was like burgundy maroon like my nails are kind of chipping away but um <laughs> i i don't have maroon shoes but if i did i probably would have worn them but i like the pop of color it's kind of like complimentary yeah and then this is the only coat that i have that i could like oh i haven't noticed the bottoms i'll have to right. take a close-up of that Those are, they kind of look like mushrooms you know how i took a bicycle so this is the only coat where if i sit oh. the coat doesn't touch the wheels so that that was like partly it was because <laughs> it was practical right second question would be like more digging into like cultural aspects like where you are from and how your background culture can impact um everything but mainly like fashion yeah i think in terms of that it reminds me how i recently got a membership at the met museum which is actually right behind you yeah. we're filming right behind this museum which is incredible mm -hmm. i went to the chinese arts areas and i was looking at a lot of common motifs used mm -hmm. and feeling really inspired in my head, I really wanted to create sort of like interpretive artworks um, of my cats in like the oh, same mm -hmm. kind of mythological creature styles um, from from Chinese traditional watercolors mm -hmm. and whatnot. And then it got me thinking about like textiles I can make and like thinking about the um, the fabrics and colorways used. In college, I dabbled a little bit into into like trying to make red satins and how that mm -hmm. is such an important color in Chinese um, history about like, well, I think during the Cultural Revolution, like red became so much about nationalism, but then yeah. before that it was about fortune and luck and fertility and whatnot. And like, mm -hmm. I think I didn't even realize how, how much red I have in my closet until I think I was like hanging everything up and I don't have a really big wardrobe so I have it outside of my mm -hmm. this whole closet and it's like visible to me how much bright red I have mm -hmm. and a part of that is super influenced by my grandma my mom's mom mm -hmm. and she loves red and speaking about a little bit about um, my pre I guess my mom's pre-immigration life where in China, people were actually not very, I guess, they were very fearful of wearing bright, noticeable colors. Okay. Especially during the cultural, the cultural revolution, I was interviewing my grandma during my um, senior year DP, mm -hmm. which is like, what do you call that? It's like art thesis, basically. Okay, yeah. I was interviewing her about what kind of textiles existed and why she was so passionate about wearing red mm -hmm. and really crazy patterns right now and I feel like a lot of grannies you see they're wearing like the most overt almost sometimes like really bad patterns and they always have their big sunglasses too yeah and it's because when they were young first of all clothes were very hard to come by maybe they got one new garment every year mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah and I was so shocked to hear that people didn't really wear anything other than beige dark blues and gray and that's just 
not really it was an unspoken law oh, and if uh -huh. you did wear anything bright you would just get really strange looks people would just be very 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 weirded out by you in public most of the brightly colored items especially even polyester it was to us now it's like oh this cheap fabric that's mm -hmm. everywhere no one cares about it but polyester was a new innovation mm -hmm. um, during that time and it was really hard to come by and just so rare because of how durable it was my grandma was talking to me about when plastic first started appearing she had a little like grocery shop from that was like the family's business and when for some reason they would get a plastic bag it was so precious that they would wash it and put it like uh, just like you put clothes drying in the string right, and they yeah the plastic bags them. because it was like something so good and it can make so many different things out of yeah. a plastic bag um, yeah and then look where we are now with <laughs> yes. the abundance of it so we just abuse <laughs> it basically like we don't value it anymore yeah um so i guess back to your original question like how has it influenced me i feel like to this point where I'm gonna hopefully make new garments and I have my own little studio going on I want to design some clothes for myself I'm just thinking a lot more about how I can embrace my cultural heritage and like now when I think about the color red next year is my it's a year of the tiger so mm -hmm. um, in Chinese I actually don't know what it's called in English but it's called Beningian in Chinese where it is kind of a crucial year for you like it's like a turning point year where if you don't wear red then it's very bad luck Ooh. so it's like very superstitious where you yeah. want to wear red every day and you either have an like a staple article every day, clothing wow. every day so maybe you would get a bracelet with red thread oh, okay or my mom had red underwear that she, okay. she bought like a whole set for her year and mm -hmm. she would wear it every day and not be pressured on the outside mm -hmm. but it's um just very important Wow. culturally for us to be wearing red and yeah. then I have been I guess that's why I was telling you I've been noticing how much red I already have first of all oh that's and why okay. I've been accumulating in my head okay like next year all of my outfits are going to be a little bit of red every day because I would like to make it a fashion challenge right I don't want to yes, just wear underwear, underwear every day um, maybe yeah. like a red lip could count or something so it's nice that I already own so much red and like in my online store I have red and green that's like kind mm -hmm. of the two colors so like yeah, I like that. It already kind of shows my preference for the color. So we were talking about colors, and you have a really colorful style. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever had such a colorful style? How's like your relationship with colors has molded throughout the time? Let's see. I'm actually thinking, well, there was definitely a noticeable turning point because when I was 17, 18, mm -hmm. my style was very influenced by edgy sophisticated mm -hmm. monochromatic black gray not even white so much i was afraid to wear lighter colors i like yeah. darker tones so it was like a lot of black and gray and almost no color mm -hmm. so where did i even begin i want to say like the huge reason why i became so I, my appetite for hunger grew quickly was the end of my freshman year of university mm -hmm. i majored in textiles and then when I started looking at all these yarns and I was looking at patterns and weavings and knittings mm -hmm. of I guess like really famous rugs or anything else they're all really colorful and then when I set out to make homework for my weaving we had to pick colors for our warps right for our loom mm -hmm. and then like who wants to knit a boring black black and gray thing like the more colorful it is more like interesting and mm. exciting it is for me mm -hmm. to kind of see it like come out and I think my first was yellow and uh, yellow and pink or something because and then those are like two colors I still really love yes. yellow was like my favorite color that year mm -hmm. I just wanted yellow everywhere so that was probably why now that I'm like asking you this question I was thinking for me how it like all started because I also had that like I'd say it was like 8th grade, ninth grade when I was really into the black so I was like black is classy, black can never go wrong and I think this is a funny answer but I think when I got my iPad and I started using Procreate I don't know if you use Procreate but yeah. you have the different ways of viewing the color palettes like in yeah, the wheel, yeah. in the thingy and I was editing videos for this YouTuber and she liked a really bright full aesthetic and she would always say like oh I wish there were like more colors because I want like it's graphic to have different color combinations sometimes i would even like close my eyes and just pick two colors out of the wheel and see wow. if they would go together wow, okay. and i think like 
she made me start to use more color because I was influenced by her style and then just overall like with the editing and everything I used to think that you know there's a color palette and that's all but when you go into the wheel there's like so many funny things you can right. do and get new colors yeah. and I was thinking about it that's actually funny yeah I guess like what basically happened to both of us is that we stopped attaching ourselves to I guess the the connotations of certain colors like black yes. is timeless black will I think like growing up I'm like oh black will make me look pale and Chinese culture oh. like, you want to look pale and that's like yeah. what people really cared about I think I wanted to look mature and black looked mm. like mature yeah and I yeah yeah so then when we started making art mm -hmm. and like looking at the colors and feeling emotions that had nothing mm -hmm. to do with the way we dressed yeah we started loving the colors for what it was mm -hmm. and then it just started like coming into our lives yeah in way, right you do a lot of different types of art like fashion painting editing how do they all like come together and influence your fashion and how do they like do you feel like your paintings sometimes the aesthetic or the colors differ from your video editing or does it all blend together like i can definitely see how my paintings and illustrations are a lot more unpredictable mm -hmm. and almost freeing because it doesn't really matter the outcome as much with paintings right now i'm still figuring out how i really like to do things so i have mm -hmm. less of a pressure to use a limited palette i don't have a signature theme like yeah. a lot of famous artists do mm -hmm. where we always use bright orange and blue or something like that mm -hmm. so my paintings are just always blank slates i can really go anywhere with it and i'm experimenting so i would say like most of the time what i'm aiming for is just playfulness mm -hmm. and that's like one element that i could see be consistent and maybe because when you dress up you have to go out with that outfit and when you edit a video you're going to publish the video with a painting it's more like you can like it or not you can True. share it or not i went to scotland in 2018 to work with Kantiki for their travel video, I brought my yellow coat, the one that I always wear, mm -hmm. and they were saying it was so nice to be able to see me in the crowd. Let's start with the most meaningful piece. I was originally gonna bring my SpongeBob pajamas, but then oh I my god, like, that was so cool! Because. I think that answers the prompt most accurately, but then I thought, well, you could kind of know what it sounds like in your head. SpongeBob pajamas, yeah. right? Pajama pants. That was really meaningful to me, and it's super old and ugly because I've had it since middle school. So it's like a meaningful apparel because I had it through university. It was like a little token of my childhood. It's like your comfort pajama. But I have this, it's my favorite thrifted item, and I find it to be meaningful because it really spoke to my style when I was in art school. Like, I, I think less now, I'm like obsessed with it, but I mean, I think this goes with my shoes, you know, like the green yeah. today. Oh, it's um, scary. Yeah. But it's just like meaningful to me because it's such a good vintage find. Like, you just never see this kind of pinafore dress mm -hmm. anymore. And it is velvet with like the most unique floral print. Yeah, like, I most, feel like we see a lot of floral prints right now but none of them like this is a very specific floor of it's super specific and then i was even thinking to to design like a kind of floral inspired by this mm -hmm. to like react to this vintage print because i just never see this but re rebirth version mm -hmm. and i traveled a lot with this dress and i like that it's really year-round because i can wear a really thin shirt under or a sweater this is the one i wore to scotland as i was saying earlier it's just my favorite, I guess. It just reminds me of what it feels like to be 19. It also, like you were saying, you used to wear more black and then you started getting into yeah. color. I feel like this piece really represents a middle term because it's colorful, but the background is still dark. So it kind of makes yeah, yeah. sense with the transition, you know? Yeah, it's kind of like a coming of age. Kind yes! Of. Yeah, or um, the period where I was finding my style. I feel mm -hmm. like this is where Piper started coming into view because my brand is Piper Blue yeah. and I always go by Annabelle but Piper is my artist mm -hmm. alter ego yeah. so this is like Piper the Piper dress <laughs> this is her costume yeah yeah and then the second item I have behind me oh my god so this bucket hat is quite out of my comfort zone I've only worn it once out usually I ask people for like things that are out of their comfort zones but I've never seen an item that's like so iconic 
that's really like that is actually out of the comfort zone and not pretending to be out of the comfort zone i think sometimes we buy pieces and for some reason just think that they're different from what we're used to wearing but me from the outside perspective uh, i never noticed that they're uh, like actually different okay well Does the reason why sense? this is so unique is because it was like a one-off it was um i found it in a sample sale okay. in soho and it was like this small designer that tried a bunch of different things so like i think the designer oh, actually this was like an experiment it was an experiment because if you look at the bucket hat it's probably thrifted it's like some fishing hat okay from uh-huh. from like any kind of sports store and then they dip dyed it so it's pink on the inside mm-hmm. and then they just hand stitch all these crazy sequins wow. on top uh-huh. so it took a lot of work but then like, they sold it for 25 dollars because i think no one really cared for it. it and then i was so attracted to it because pink is my power color this year okay and i was like okay i don't even care They're like this is my new life in new york and then i ended up being really shy and only wearing it <laughs> when once. you wore it where did you wear it with you remember i yeah it was a kind of hot day so i wore it with orange Um, it was just a plain orange t-shirt, mm-hmm. really blue jeans, and heels, I think. I think it was like slides. Oh, that day I actually wore this hat with pink sunglasses. So that oh, was like, that would be. It was kind of a mood, you know, uh-huh. like a hat with those like little um, oval sunglasses. Something I was thinking is, why is it a problem if clothing wears you? Because yeah. we always hear, you don't want that dress to be wearing you, you want to wear the dress. It's like, overpowering but i kind of feel like this hat wears me mm-hmm. like i just exist as a body <laughs> so that this hat can like walk around but then that's okay like i don't necessarily find it super flattering for me but then why don't i want to feel like an abstract art yeah sculpture? like my head is just like this uh-huh. sequence today then who cares like if it makes me look beautiful or if it like makes my features pop or something something really interesting that i've been thinking about while we're talking is like I always ask people, oh, how was your relationship with fashion? But something I'm realizing in this relation, in this conversation is that you can have different relationships with fashion, like depending on the yeah. outfit you're wearing, like you, the clothing can be wearing you or you could want to wear an outfit where the clothes really fit you or maybe where you're just like wearing a bunch of different items and it's yeah. even more like an art expression than it is like to dress you because maybe it doesn't even fit. Why not just have different intentions? The one case where it's unfortunate is if you didn't want the dress to be wearing you, but then it is. Yes. So that's like kind of the bad. But then if you intend it's for it to totally wear you, then like, okay, mm-hmm. then do it, right? I have a question that's like a funny, quick one, which is if your cats were people, what outfits would you imagine them wearing? And I can wow. then like piece out yeah. items in the editing and like make them wear them. Amazing. This is actually so creative. <laughs> I love this question. Let me think about Prairie first, okay? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to list out personality. I think Prairie is quite, quite picky. She, for example, in food, she loves finer things because mm. she lived with my sister and her boyfriend for a whole year and he... It was like a chef so he brought good food <laughs> yeah. home and from my from what i heard she would eat like really caviar <laughs> she ate like chicken cutlets that oh he would prepare God. like without spices or oils mm-hmm. and then she would also have raw tuna sashimi so for prairie i feel like she almost feels like she owns the place a lot uh-huh. and i i could see her in one of those coats where there's like a fur collar and fur oh yeah hem, like that kind uh-huh. and it's a little bit long so and like by the knees <laughs> and then she would probably wear some like boot cut jeans and fancy fancy shoes that are like like a really nice leather that gleam almost like a unique yet timeless color so let's say like a mauve rose like something that's very unique it's not just tan or not black but it's like pink but then it's not like this pink it's going to be like a brown pink Mm -hmm. she would probably have on hoop earrings that have like (laughs) rhinestones something really fancy yeah that's how i imagine her And then Bambi is all about 
soft comfort. I can see him always sitting on my wool sweaters and he sneaks into my closet on the bottom to sleep. Oh yeah. So he'll definitely be wearing a sweater vest. I can see him <laughs> in a sweater vest. <laughs> what pattern? And then probably like something classic like, fit, like those um, grandma Argyle. Like yeah, that's what like I was that, thinking. Yeah, like diamond mm-hmm. run. And mm-hmm. then underneath something cute, like a little collared shirt that okay. makes him look kind of like 90s, like poofy. Um, <laughs> I'm loving this. And then just like really simple. What is that one brand? Like Dickies? Uh-huh. It's that brand of pants that's kind of like yeah, they're utilitarian, uh-huh. right? So I can see him wear that. And then he'd be wearing like um, Doc Martin Oxfords. <laughs> Because it's like kind of stylish, but then super durable. Okay. And then just more about like being practical. Mm. So that would be Bambi's. looking at someone I admire and be like should I be like that like, yeah should I settle to only do this kind of art but then I like oh I don't know that's so limiting and I think that's such a thing we have with our own selves that we view ourselves as being messy or not having specific specific style I realize this a lot of times when people look at us they don't see that they see what represents us but sometimes we can't see what represents us yeah. Like, when I started editing a video for a new YouTuber, a friend texted me and she was like, Oh my god, did you edit this? This really looks like you. And for me, I would never think that people could recognize it because I don't see the pattern. But people right. from outside, they saw the patterns. And another classmate I knew also said, Everything you do is you. It comes from yes. you in some way. So it's going to have your hand in it. It's going to have your unique print mm-hmm. in it no matter what you do. And just not to worry so much about it. So instead of focusing on how you want your final destination to look like mm-hmm. just focus on what you like doing as long mm-hmm. as you really enjoy it mm-hmm. everybody has their own collection like of items or colors that you have an affinity to mm-hmm. and almost that's like already decided for you like exactly the conversation you had i was just talking kind of complaining to a friend of mine saying like i don't have a style and he's like what like when i look at your stuff i totally see yeah. your style we're talking in the cafe about like content being self-centered or kind of maybe I don't know if this translates it correctly but for me it's like kind of being afraid of being egocentric or self-centered because what I'm doing is like about me or it's my face on it but at the end of the day it's what you're saying everything you do is made by you so even if you were to be a lawyer and not a youtuber or a doctor it's still gonna be you because you're the one doing it right and I think the fear of being of being egocentric is almost the opposite of actually being egotistic. Oh, people who worry about it are probably the not. Ones and the ones that point it out, I think, are also afraid of criticism themselves. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong, I guess, of embracing and making things about yourself mm-hmm. unless you're impeding or harming someone else, right? Like, yes. I feel like that's the boundary. Like, are you are you oppressing someone else? Are you offending mm-hmm. someone else? I'm learning to like take a space. You have the right to take a space. If someone doesn't want to see the photo shoot of you, then yeah, why are not they following you? you? Why are they choosing to be here? They're not. <laughs> they're not forced to. Mm-hmm. So never, never feel. I guess the pressure to edit or trim down yourself so that mm-hmm. other people can be more comfortable with your existence. Mm-hmm. When you're picking an outfit, like when you're building an outfit, do you have like? If you would have to put it into an equation, like I do this and then I do this, like I pick a color and then I choose my shoes or Mm, I see something, like how do you build your outfits when you're getting dressed? So to be completely honest about building outfits, it definitely starts with either what is the occasion or what's the weather today. Okay. So a lot of times today I had to think, what am I doing? I had to ride a bicycle. Mm -hmm. So I know I can't wear this or this or this and I'm going to wear this. Rarely do I ever take something off because I'm like, wait, that actually oh. doesn't work. I, that, that almost never happens yeah. to me. Just start off with a certain piece because for me lately, I've been wearing black and white 
or like basic tops every day and then I just have like way too many pairs of pants so I always start with the pants and then I build it up in the pants oh, do you do wow. that or do you just pick an item and it's not related to what it is I guess I'm actually super comfort over style now because okay. it's never about how good I want to look it's mm -hmm. about how practical is this outfit for today's activities mm -hmm. If I'm gonna go over and cook with a friend, I know I'm gonna want to wear a certain thing mm -hmm. and not like a super chunky sweater or something. Mm -hmm. So, weather, like what is the temperature? I always check the weather no matter what because it changes so much here. Mm -hmm. Like today, I knew I wanted to wear something warmer. Mm -hmm. So I picked a turtleneck and because it's burgundy, I thought, oh, I'm gonna wear my burgundy corduroy. Like, mm -hmm. okay, it's gonna match. And then I was like, then I'm gonna go for burgundy socks. socks. Like, <laughs> okay, we're going for a total uh -huh. monochromatic look today. Other than weather, I would base it off of color. So if I wore like an orange shirt, I'm going to look for probably the complimentary or mm -hmm. even, I call it my carrot and celery soup outfits where it's like <laughs> orange and green. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for being in my video. I have a feeling that I'm gonna see you someday, maybe in Portugal. I would love, oh my God. If you want to spend like a week, two weeks, a month in Portugal, especially in the summer, just like beautiful beach. I'll send you photos so that I can like get you in. That was the video. That was a great ending. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Subscribe. Bye. Rolling up like big shot, big shot. Never is when I stop. Hit the highway one. Now we headed for the boardwalk. What's it? Who sir? What's it? Who sir? I ride. Boardwalk. 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 What's it? Who sir? What's it? Just sir. I ride. Boardwalk.